Hey guys, welcome back to the channel. I'm Office Blow Dance. I'm G. Office Blow Caden. Okay, before we start, if Patreon is a thing that you like to uh, indulge in, yes. check out the link below and uh, check out what we've got on our Patreon channel. Full watch alongs of things like Modern Family, uh, F is for Family, uh, Seinfeld, Always Sunny in Philadelphia, The Quarterback. Loads of stuff on there, isn't they? Yeah. Uh, all starts at $3 a month. Yeah. It's all the way up to $5 a yeah. month. Yeah. Bargain. Uh, bit of Mr. Ballin. Yeah, we've done him for a while. We've done him for a while, have we? Yeah. No. But, uh, great storyteller. Yeah. Quite like his videos. Yeah. Gets you gets you into the uh, into the zone of what it's all about. Yeah. Doesn't he? Yeah. That's, I don't know what this is about. A disaster you've never heard of is still controlling our timeline. Mm. What could this be? I don't know. Let's get yeah. into it. It's a mystery. One night in 1944, an American military pilot was flying over England when he turned around in his cockpit and looked at this panel of switches that was right behind him. And after looking for a particular switch, he reached out and he was about to toggle it, but he stopped because he knew what he was about to do, flipping the switch, would easily be the most dangerous thing he had ever done in his entire life. But this was his duty. He had to do it. And so after taking a deep breath, he flipped the switch. And immediately, chaos ensued, and the course of American history would be drastically changed forever. If you've never heard the story before, and many people have not, this is not nearly as well known as it should be, then you are in for a huge reveal at the end. But before we get into that story, if you're a fan of the strange, dark, and mysterious delivered in story format, then you've come to the right place because that's all we do, and we upload once a week. So if that's of interest to you, please secretly log in to the like button's computer and then transfer all of their Bitcoin to your untraceable offshore account. Also, please subscribe to our channel and turn on all notifications so you don't miss any of our weekly uploads. Okay, let's get into today's story. At around 5.30 p.m. on the evening of August 12, 1944, a young American military pilot named Joe walked out of his quarters on his base in England where he was stationed. And as soon as he was outside, he lit a cigarette to calm his nerves, and as he smoked the cigarette, he began walking towards the huge hangar on the other side of the base where his plane was waiting for him. Joe had been preparing for this night for weeks. He and his co-pilot, a 35-year-old lieutenant who was nicknamed Bud, were about to step off on a top secret military mission called Operation Aphrodite. And this mission was not only top secret, but it was so unbelievably dangerous that basically anybody who knew about it considered it a suicide mission. But Joe tried not to think about that as he walked towards the hangar. Instead, he tried to think about the reason he was here in the first place, the reason he had joined the military, and that was to defeat the Nazis. And what he and his co-pilot were about to do, Operation Aphrodite, was going to play a huge role in defeating the Nazis. So this was about five years. Think about the technology he had back then, mm. back then as well. Nothing like the technology you got nowadays. No. You know? How does he know what he's thinking, though? I think what, what he's what he's yeah he's, he's like when he's walking over to the hangar he was thinking this like how would he know that I think they're just building the story of how, yeah, how yeah, you would, if you've been that, given yeah, something yeah. to do how would you be feeling yeah. Yeah. I mean, if yeah. everyone's thinking it's a suicide mission then you know you'd be feeling pretty uh, nervous wouldn't you yeah. so like a bit shaky going yeah. into it you know a bit doubtful mm. into World War Two and at this point the Nazis were actually losing however it was making them more dangerous not less because they were becoming very, very desperate. And so they were launching all these outrageous attacks basically because they had nothing to lose. And one horrible thing the Nazis were doing at this time were dropping these things called vengeance weapons. Hitler called them vengeance weapons. They were basically these huge bombs that the Nazis would drop arbitrarily across the United Kingdom on major population centers. And by this point in the war, these vengeance weapons had killed over 5,000 civilians. And at this exact moment, like this night, as Joe was walking towards the hangar, the Nazis had a stash of vengeance weapons aimed directly at London. That was going to be their next target. And so the mission that Joe and his co-pilot Bud were going on, Operation Aphrodite, was going to be to go out and destroy those vengeance weapons to save London. And as nervous as Joe was about this mission, and he was really nervous, he was also very excited. He actually had volunteered for this mission when many other pilots had done everything they could to stay away from this mission. And on top of that, Joe actually had flown enough missions by this point in the war that he didn't need to fly anymore. He could just go home. 
but instead he volunteered for this mission. And the reason why Joe might have decided to do that has a lot to do with the family he was raised in. So Joe came from a family that was very successful and accomplished, and his father really pushed Joe and his younger brother to be the very best at whatever they were doing and to be very competitive with each other. And so while Joe and his younger brother did love each other, they also had a pretty intense rivalry. And for a while, Joe's father obviously favored Joe. I mean, Joe was the favorite child and, you know, his father would always say, Joe's going to be the president someday. He's so talented. But after the attack on Pearl Harbor that brought the United States into World War II, both Joe and his younger brother joined the military. And pretty early on in the war, Joe's younger brother got an award for heroism. He had basically saved his platoon of men and he won all these awards and he was all over the news. And pretty quickly after that, Joe felt like he fell out of favor with his dad. That his dad kind of looked at the younger brother as being the favorite child now. And so Joe really started to feel insecure and wanted to prove himself really to his dad. And so when Operation Aphrodite came up, Joe volunteered for it really because he wanted to be a hero. He wanted to show his dad that he too could do something huge and change the course of history. And he would change the course of history, but not in the way he expected. And so Joe continued to smoke a cigarette and hustled across the base towards the hangar. And as he did, he found himself kind of speeding up. Like he just wanted to get over there and get started. Joe's commanders had given him a special code he would call out over the radio if this mission was successful. It was spade flush, that's what he'd say over the radio. And so as Joe hustled towards the hangar, he imagined how incredible it was gonna be to yell out spade flush over the radio. I mean, it was only like 30 minutes away from that moment. This was a short mission. And so finally Joe reached the hangar and he looked up to the sky one more time to make sure the weather looked solid because actually they had tried to launch Operation Aphrodite a couple of days earlier but it had been canceled because of fog. But Joe looked around and the weather looked good. And so he knew it was gonna be a go. So he flipped his cigarette butt and stepped into the hangar. Inside this hangar was this massive big open space. And in the center of the hangar on the floor was this huge plane called a B-24 Liberator. This was of course Joe's plane for the night. And so Joe immediately began walking towards the plane to check it out. Now, this particular type of plane was the type of plane Joe had been flying for the past three years. I mean, he'd flown many combat missions in this type of aircraft, so he was very familiar with it. But this particular B-24 was unlike any of the other B-24s Joe had ever flown. In fact, this aircraft was so unique, it was unlike any aircraft that any pilot in the American military had ever flown. I mean, this was really a one of one. And so as Joe walked around the outside of this plane, he began to notice some of these unique modifications that the mechanics had made to this aircraft. The most noticeable modification was actually the cockpit. Now, normally the cockpit had all these windows basically all around it so the pilot could look in any direction and see what was going on, but obviously they needed to be protected from the elements. But this B-24 had all the glass removed except for one pane of glass basically right in front of where Joe would be staring. So it's not like, uh, well, I guess there's a little small windscreen there will propel any uh, birds out your well, way. I was going to say, but it's surely you're going to get loads of like, stuff yeah, in your face. Get, yeah, it's going to be cold. <laughs> it would be, wouldn't it? Yeah, very windy. Yeah, but it's, uh, yeah, because these cars they make like that now still. Yeah. That don't come with a roof or anything. Yeah, it starts raining yeah, or anything. Start, I think a plane's moving a bit faster though, mate. Yeah, well, I don't know. I've seen an Aston Martin with one of them windscreens. No windscreen, remember? Yeah. One that have no one. And you get a pair of goggles with it. <laughs> give you a set of goggles instead. Just like a single windshield. And so it's almost like it was a convertible aircraft where it was all open air in the cockpit. And the reason for this change is because Joe and his co-pilot during the course of this top secret mission, Operation Aphrodite, they would have to jump out and parachute ah. to the ground. And so by having this all open, it would allow them to do that much easier. And then another big modification to the B-24 is the guns that were normally located on the outside of the aircraft were gone and they were replaced by broomsticks painted black to look like guns at a distance. But the visible changes to this particular B-24 were nothing compared to the massive changes that were hidden inside this aircraft. Because the top secret part of Operation Aphrodite was really this particular plane. The plane was not really a plane, it was more like a huge flying bomb. The military's mechanics it's basically kamikaze. hollowed out the entirety of this plane. Almost like a kamikaze mission, isn't it? Yeah. Just crash the plane into wherever you need to go, but you bail just before the... Uh, the, the thing is, if you bail, how, how do you know when you get onto the floor you're not going to get killed anyway? Well, you might do. You might get... You know, you've got... I'm sure you'd have that planned out. 
the plan is the plan is to sort of like to to pick them up. Isn't just it? like crash down and just land wherever you can. They'll yeah. have a place for him to land. But like I say, the, t- the technology and everything that used to go forward with what what you've got today in nineteen forty four, when whenever he said this was, it's yeah. just not the same as what it is today, is no. it? Mm. But this is similar to a kamikaze, kamikaze mission. But yeah. I'm not sure the kamikaze pilots of Japan or wherever they were from um, ejected, did they? Yeah, they stayed. No, I think they stayed in the plane, didn't oh, they? Really, just killed yeah. themselves. Yeah. Really? Yeah, I think so. Wow. Plane removed not everything inside sure, of it that was not absolutely vital, and they replaced it with explosives. Ten tons of explosives. Like this is an unbelievable amount of explosives. A few minutes later, at around 5:55 p.m., Joe and his co-pilot Bud, who by this point had come into the hangar, finished doing their exterior inspection of the aircraft, and then they climbed into the cockpit, with Joe taking a seat in the pilot seat and Bud sitting in the co-pilot seat. And even though the evening was cool, both men were visibly sweating. Once the pilots got the go-ahead to begin the mission, Joe fired the first engine and then turned to look at the ground crew all around them, and he noticed all of them looked really, really serious. I mean, they obviously knew how intensely dangerous this mission really was, and the fact was, you know, the pilots might not make it home, and so they're looking up at these guys like, I'm sorry you have to do this. But Joe, you know, he looked out at these people and he sensed that was going on, and so he made a big show to wave and smile at them, to show confidence, like he knew what he was gonna do, he's gonna be fine. But in reality, Joe really was terrified. In about 10 seconds, I'm gonna hold something up in front of the camera that our team has been working on for over a year and it's finally ready to be revealed and we know you're gonna love it. All right, drum roll please, here we go. And it's the Strange, Dark and Mysterious delivered in book format. The official Mr. Ballin graphic novel. Our first book ever. In this just stunningly beautiful anthology of stories are full stories that are brand new and have never been covered anywhere else on any of our other channels. So if you want to hear those new stories, you got to get this book. The book is pre-order a book right description. And if enough of people, but more community, videos.com, sure you stick around, tell you a little personal story from my, also speak tells about friends. Just click on go to book.day and help us get on that New York Times bestsellers list. Go for it. Yeah. By 5.59 p.m., Joe had all four propellers spinning on the aircraft, and so he released the brake and began taxiing out to the runway. And as they bumped along, Joe and Bud became really aware of just how heavy this aircraft was from all the explosives. I mean, every bump, this plane is lurching up and down and really creaking and making lots of noises. Take a while to take off this. It'll take some power to get it it off the ground. I'm wondering if it is going to be able to take Mm. off and where, where they're supposed to land it. Well, it's not like banging in the middle of London or not. They're not landing. No, it won't be in London. What are they? Not they're Americans. Themselves. They're Americans. I thought, it was, I thought it was American based in London. Yeah, but he's not going to crash it in London, is he? You're well, not going to blow your own bloody city that's up, where, That's where his military that's where that's where base is. Yeah, that's where they're starting. That's what I'm saying. Where's he going to? Probably Germany. Probably Germany, right, yeah. Okay. Kill the Nazis. I mean, this was sketchy. I don't know, Finally. because he did say it was a half an hour mission. Yeah, he did. Before. Yeah. And there's like, like a German base. Could be a boat. Yeah, boat. Or well, like a German city. base nearby in France or something, I don't know. Yeah, probably be, be uh, case, for a boat. Hey, Joe went full speed ahead, and he and Joe went tearing down the runway. It's going to be out soon for him to land The plane did get lift, and it took off into the air. And then just up ahead of him were six other planes that had just taken off moments before who were going to escort Joe and Bud to their target area. Once Joe got the plane to its cruising altitude, he and Bud kind of relaxed for a second and began preparing themselves for what was going to happen next. They had about 15 minutes of just kind of casual flying before the real work of this mission began. The vengeance weapons that Joe and Bud were going out to destroy as part of Operation Aphrodite were located about 120 miles south, just outside of this little town in the very northern tip of France. But destroying these weapons would not be as simple as just Joe and Bud flying over top and releasing all their explosives and flying back home because the Nazis had buried these vengeance weapons deep inside the hills in this town in northern France. And so regular bombs wouldn't touch these vengeance weapons. They had to do it a different way. And the way they were going to do it was Joe and Bud were going to fly their plane directly into the hills. And the way they would do this is they would fly their plane as close to the target area as possible, at which point one of the other pilots that were in the escort planes would take remote control of the B-24 flying bomb. And then once they had remote control, 
Joe and Bud, who no longer needed to do anything, they would jump out and parachute to the ground, and then the pilot who was remotely flying this now vacant B-24 flying bomb, they would just set it on autopilot to crash into the hills. At around 6.15 p.m., just as the English Channel came into view, Joe toggled a switch on his control panel, and then after he did, he and Bud kind of held their breath for a second to see what would happen. And then a couple of seconds later, the plane kind of shuddered for a second and then leveled out. And then a call came over the radio from one of the pilots who were in Go the control. escort planes telling Joe and Bud that they had just successfully taken remote control of the B-24. So at this point, Joe and Bud are no longer flying the aircraft. They're just sitting inside of this flying bomb. Now, there were only two things left for Joe and Bud to do before they could bail out to safety. They would need to arm the plane, so basically arm the explosives and make them ready to detonate. And then after that was done, they would need to call out over the radio, spade flush, the code Joe was given, which would signal to everybody else that the plane was ready and Joe and Bud were jumping out. And so once Joe and Bud nodded to each other and kind of acknowledged that, okay, we're gonna do the last bit of this mission, Joe turned around in a seat and he looked at this control panel that was right behind him and on this panel was the arming switch. And so once Joe flipped this, he and Bud would have a very short window of time to safely escape the aircraft. And so it was kind of like, you know, flip it, make the radio call and get the heck out of there. But Joe and Bud had trained for this moment over and over and over again, so they were ready. And so eventually Joe flipped the switch, grabbed his radio and called out spade flush. What Joe and Bud could not have known when the mechanics were making all these modifications to this B-24 was that one of the mechanics accidentally crossed some wires in putting in all these explosives. What? And so just seconds after Joe had armed the explosives, they detonated. They were not supposed to, but they did. And so Joe and Bud were killed basically a fraction Jesus. of a second wow. after calling out Spade Flush. But it would turn out the catastrophic failure of Operation Aphrodite had no impact on World War II. In fact, Operation Aphrodite should never have happened in the first place. It was totally unnecessary. What Joe and Bud and the rest of the American military didn't know at the time was five weeks earlier, the British Royal Air Force dropped a whole bunch of ground penetrating bombs all across those hills in Northern France and they destroyed all of the vengeance weapons. So when Joe and Bud took off on this doomed mission, there was no threat to London. Wow. We might have been speaking to each other, right? Hello? Matt. We're just going to drop these on this. Oh, we've already done that, mate. Yeah. Yeah. What a cock up. Yeah, especially when two lives are lost as well. Yeah. Yeah, bad. None. But that is not the big reveal in this story because Operation Aphrodite changed the course of American history in a really specific and really enormous way. Because Joe, whose full name was Joseph P. Kennedy Jr., was a member of the very famous oh, Kennedy family, wow. a big time political family in America. And at the time, the Kennedys were all saying, Joseph is going to be the next president of the United States. And everybody believed it. He was gonna be the guy. But then of course, Operation Aphrodite changed all of that because Joseph was killed. And so the war would end about a year later, and when it did, Joseph's younger brother, John F. Kennedy, who won that award for heroism and got a Purple Heart mm -hmm. early on in the war, and he kind of became a war hero, which prompted Joe to volunteer for Operation Aphrodite. Yeah, John would begin his unbelievable political rise. And by 1960, John F. Kennedy, JFK, would become the 35th president of the United States, even though he wasn't supposed to. He was the second choice. It should have been Joe. How do we not know this story before? I've never heard that story. Yeah. I was going to say as well before, he kind of looks like John F. Kennedy. Was really? He? Yeah, like yeah. That right at the start. Yeah, that's a... Uh, that that's an incredible story, that, isn't it? Is that the end of the... Uh, I guess that's the end of it, right? Yeah, it's probably just going to show photos. Right? Yeah. But that's, a, that's an incredible story. Yeah. If it's... Well, I'm sure... I'm, well, you can't say can't, if it's not true. It's got to be true, hasn't it? It's true, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. But the only thing I had... So like he, he talked about the start was how he how he recently joined the navy or joined the um the air force or whatever it was or the army, um but then he referred to something where he's done operations prior, and mm. I thought maybe maybe I didn't hear it properly but mm. it was uh but yeah what a story that is yeah. that's quite that's crazy that. he was number two number two in line because it should have been his brother yeah Joe yeah yeah it's uh Joe F Joe F Kennedy <laughs> 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 would have been different wouldn't it yeah. But yeah, what a story. Interesting, that. Yeah. Never knew that. Yeah. Learned something. Mind you, my, my history and knowledge on World War II is pretty limited. Yeah, mine isn't very so I never really studied it at school. 
It's, uh, it's not something they kind of moved on to other things we were we were learning about at school from history but never really sort of got into history anyway no and the funny thing is i'm on a group where we talk about who we liked at school teachers and stuff yeah. and every single person said i hated this teacher and it was the history teacher so obviously nobody learned history <laughs> yeah it's always the way in it you, yeah. you prefer to uh, do a subject where you get on with the teacher i guess yeah. it'd be a lot easier yeah Anyway, great story, that Mr. Ballin. Yeah. Back on Mr. Ballin, uh, fantastic, uh, yeah. as always. Great storyteller. Yes. And uh, get his book as well. Yeah. Yeah, great great presents, uh, birthday and Christmas, I guess. Yeah, Easter presents. Yeah, Easter presents, yeah. Anyway, hope you guys enjoyed it. Don't forget to like and subscribe. We'll see you on the next one. Cheers. Cheers. Bye.